Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Steve Hamm. He's a freelance writer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker, and he's the author of the book we're going to talk about today, The Pivot, Addressing Global Pr Problems Through Local Action. So, Steve, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Great. Thank you for being having me on. That's great. So tell us uh, generally about the pivot projects you talk about in the book. What are these about? What are their main goals, etc.? Sure. Um, I'll start with a little story. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, think back a little over two years ago when 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 COVID was just starting to hit Northern Europe or starting to hit Europe and, and starting to hit the United States in, in, with a vengeance and. Uh, it's you know we we've never experienced anything like this in our in our lifetimes. I guess the flu of 19, 1918 was like it in some ways, but there was it was a chaotic moment. What was going to happen? How bad would it be? What what could be done? And uh, so uh, at that time, I was working on a, on a couple of film projects, but I I got an alert on from LinkedIn. You know, so and so, your friend is doing this new thing, and I clicked through, and my friend was Colin Harrison, who was one of the top thinkers at IBM. I was there for about six years as a as a storyteller, and Colin was really the top thinker in this whole category, um, of, called the Smarter Planet. The idea was that you use sensors, data, you can analyze things more deeply, and you can understand how the world works, and you can make better decisions. So he uh, he had started. Uh, a project which ultimately became to be called Pivot Projects uh, around uh, the idea of let's act in the middle of this crisis at the beginning of this crisis and, and maybe and maybe we scientists can 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 help out you know in, in various ways because it's chaotic and it's hard to understand and um, he reached out to a bunch of people and uh, and I, I I ultimately heard about it when I when I saw his uh, his note. I called him up, and he told me he gave me a little bit of the backstory because it, you know, I'd missed a couple of weeks of it. But uh, he'd reached out to a bunch of people he knew around the world of, who were of like mind, and they decided to give this a try. And they decided to create an all-voluntary collaboration of people from around the world, and not just scientists though. They said, "Oh, let's, we need people from all domains with all different points of view," you know. Uh, geographical, demographical, you know, different kinds of expertise, all this kind of stuff. And let's bring these people together and, and, and see what we can do. And uh, the idea was that the world needs to pivot, right? And, uh, you know, we've seen things in our history where there were important pivots and pivots in thinking and the way we did things and the way we responded. And the most significant, and I think the most appropriate one to, to think about is in the 1960s when a woman named Rachel Carson, who was a relatively low-level scientist in the U.S. Forestry Service, did a bunch of research and ultimately wrote a book called Silent Spring. And it was about the impact of DDT, uh, a pesticide, on nature. And it was, mm -hmm. and it was you know, a devastating effect. And um, at the time in the United States, we had no regulations protecting the environment. There may have been other places that had them, but I, if so, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it really, it was uh, something that was generally done. But within a decade in the United States, we had the Environmental Protection Agency. We had the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. So we've seen that we can pivot rapidly if, you know, if we get the data, we get the scientists, we, we understand it, we understand what might happen, we can change the way we operate. So I think that that's what this group, um, you know, wanted to do. And uh, I mean, I guess the, the core belief was that if you combine collective intelligence with some other elements, kind of a, a stew, systems thinking, artificial intelligence, other kinds of factors that you can really help solve problems at, this, at, at all scales, from the neighborhood to the planetary. And um, so it was a really cool thing, and I was very um, fortunate. I asked him, can I be embedded as a journalist in this project? 
and kind of write about it and and and, and they said oh, of course they said yes you know and uh but ultimately out of that came the book uh, the pivot which columbia university press published last year so that's really how it got started and the basic ideas mm -hmm. but so it's primarily focused on dealing with climate change correct I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic is mostly a symptom. Well, that was one of the things that, I guess that was the triggering event, mm -hmm. but because of, you know, the way things are connected to each other, you have to, you have to take a, a broader look at things. And, mm -hmm. and they, so they hoped the pivot would be about climate and that COVID would be the wake-up call. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, what would you say are the main goals of the Pivot projects, if you were to summarize them? Well, they really, I mean, it's, it's really about increasing sustainability and resilience at the local, you know, national and planetary level. And, uh, and also, I think, as the, as the group went along, the idea that equity that kind of equitable growth or equitable, you know, the, the, the sense that we have to take into consideration the least powerful among us and that that has to be an essential part of a transformation of society. So I would say, you know, sustainability, uh, equity and, and, and resilience became the, the main goals. Um, And then, of course, you know, that we can we can address climate change in all these levels, you know, pan governmental, national, local neighborhood and individual. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the lessons I learned was we individuals can't wait around for the U.N. or for our national governments to figure things out. We have to we have to act and we have to act now. So it also has a sort of social justice uh, goal to it, right? I mean, when uh, it comes I, to being preoccupied with the people who are the least privileged in yes, our yes. societies. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I also, um, you know, this idea that kind of everything's wound up with everything else. You know, in this COVID crisis, it wasn't just a, a virus that we were dealing with. We're, we've been experienced multiple crises at once, many of them global in nature, you know, the pandemic, fires, social unrest, the rise of fascism, uh, science denial, tribalism, extreme nationalism, all the, these things are all happening at once. Loss of individual agency through like social media manipulation, you know, the fanning of the flames of hate and fear by political leaders. And then finally, what do we have now? Warfare on a large scale. So we've, we've seen this in this two, two and a half years, practically every kind of horror uh, except nuclear war and, uh, and all at the same time and all woven in with each other. And all in a, in a sense, it's like a snowball rolling downhill with all these things together. So I think, you know, that's really a key thing is you can't separate the virus from the society that it that it uh, inhabits or plagues. It's a plague. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a pretty important central mm -hmm. insight from what we've experienced these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. So if I understand it correctly, these projects focus uh, on addressing these issues at a local level. Correct. That's you know, local, national, pan-national. I mean, you know, the the first thing, I think it's really important to kind of level set here. The Pivot Projects is a big idea, and it's a model for problem solving. But I don't think anybody in Pivot Projects ever thought, oh, we're going to solve, this little group is going to solve the problems of the world. We're, we're going to experiment. We're going we're gonna to try things out. We'll, we can, we're going to do what we can do. And uh, so I think they're, you know, really very interesting projects. I mean, there's one of the projects that's going on right now is something called UN 2.0. And the idea is that the UN has become such an ossified structure 
and so focused on the elites in government and also the elites in business who influence them mm-hmm. that it's it's really isn't about the people you know and because when people think about the UN they think oh it's the people of the world coming together to solve these problems well it's the bureaucrats and the technocrats and the lobbyists of the world uh, really and so we have to we have to reform the UN so there's a you know there's a group that's working on well how do we do that and what's the you know how would we reform it and then how would we get that done so that's something that's, that's at the very highest level and then you know one thing I did is I, I kind of brought pivot projects back to my home, and other people did this too, and said, well, what can I do locally? Mm-hmm. And I started a group in my city, which is New Haven, Connecticut, halfway between Boston and New York, and it's, it's something called Reimagining New Haven in the Era of Climate Change. And it is an effort to kind of rethink the city, saying, hey, there are going to be these local impacts of climate change. There are these local risks. And they are really going to reshape our city. And mm-hmm. we have to understand them now. We have to come together and we have to act on them, not just as civil engineers and, you know, coastal management people and, you know, highway builders, but as a whole society. So from the local to the to the UN. So these kind so it's it's a variety of ideas and you know the the group was very you know in the early days there were hundreds of people active in it most you know after two and a half years most people have drifted back to their lives and stuff like that there are there are a few kind of pockets of things that are that are still being done but you know pivot projects is i I would say is gradually winding down you know and i think it kind of served its purpose it it awakened people to ideas it got people act you know active it got things going it got some policy things uh proposed that are that are smart and um i and you know it's not like it's something that has to live in in a current form one of the lessons the pivot projects learned is you don't you, you know you get you, you create things they they evolve you see what you can do with them you experiment you know and then you try something else so i think that's you know, I mean, but I, you know, one of the things is I would say is the core lesson here to me is that one of the most beautiful and powerful attributes of humanity is our willingness and ability to pull together at times of crisis and try to solve things together. Now, unfortunately, in our current political climate and, and social climate in the United States, fully half of the people did not agree with that social contract. They didn't say, let's solve this together. They said, F you, I don't care about anybody else. And I don't believe that a mask is necessary or a vaccine is necessary. I believe you're trying to control me with it. So in the end, only, you know, you'd think that it would be great to get everybody pulling together And obviously, it would have been better. It would have had better results and would have better results. But I think that even that, even that it was uh, only a partial success, shows you how important the pulling together is. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about the framework you apply or apply there, because you also touched a little bit on that. I mean, the lens through which you view environmental issues in this case and how you, and how you try to tackle them. So, for yeah. example, you mentioned systems thinking. What is that and how do you apply it there? Yeah. So, systems thinking, I believe, is one of the great ideas and great inventions of the, of the late 20th century. And it's, you know, one of the things that when you think about the 20th century, it was a, a century of specialization. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the 20th century, only a few elite people even went to college, much less went to graduate school and got a PhD. In, in countries like yours and mine, many people go to college, many people get advanced degrees, and there are many specialists. And there were great benefits from that era of specialization, but we also lost some things. And I think what we lost was 
the, the, the specialists almost have blinders on. They're looking very narrowly at something very, and very deeply. And we lose some of that connective tissue between domains and between knowledge. And um, so systems thinking is the antidote to that. It's the idea that, hey, uh, you can't solve big complex problems in isolation because ultimately everything connects to everything else. And uh, it's almost, I've, I've heard people talk about this image of if you've got a thicket like a black, uh, uh, blackberry or raspberry bushes i don't you know i don't know what you call those in, in portuguese but you know they're all woven in together and if you think oh let's neaten this up and but if you start pulling over here you know because of all the stickers and all the interweaving of things this part over here moves right so it's almost like it seems impossible so i think kind of figuring out you know Systems theory is, by its nature, interdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. It's looking at how different systems inter, you know, operate it, it within themselves and then interoperate. What, what are the what are the parts? There, there's natural systems. There's human-made systems that are all woven in together. And I think this, you know, as you as you get up, as you work up to a more complex. Um, scale it, it becomes very complicated but even at a, even at the scale of a city my city new haven has four universities and a college but also 40 percent of the population lives under poverty under the poverty level so you it's a it's a it's a microcosm of the complexity of the world right so these are this is why we need to, to deal with these things and i i think you know Systems thinking kind of grew up into something, an even bigger thought, which is complexity theory. That's really understanding how these systems uh, uh, interact with each other. And and one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the early people who was involved in pivot projects was a guy named J. D. Snowden. J. D. Snowden is this, is a complexity theorist, who actually created something when he was at IBM. This is long before I was there. I was there in the uh, from 2009 to 2016, but around the year 2000, he developed a framework called Kinevin. He's Welsh, and that's it means it kind of means habitat in Welsh. And it was basically a way of of dealing with with different kinds of situations and applying the right the right response. And you know he has this idea that there's kind of obvious situations, and then there's complicated ones, and then he says complex ones, and then chaotic ones. And and the the chaotic ones are ones where you kind of don't know where the boundaries are, you don't know what's going to happen next. It's, things are very unpredictable. How do you respond? And his answer is, well, the first thing you do is you act. You act and you experiment. You measure. And then you adapt, or or throw it out and try something else. But the idea is you have to act quickly. So you can see how, in systems thinking, it develops into an approach to decision making, and then an approach to dealing with chaos, which is what we have today. So, you know, I think that's the way I see things developing there. And uh, you know, they actually have a wonderful. He has a consulting group built around this this framework. And they have something called SenseMaker, and they call it the anti-survey. So instead of asking people a bunch of questions that are very prescribed and where they could be manipulated by the surveyor or boxed in, you ask them open-ended questions, and they basically tell stories and write about their response to things or think, you know, things that are bothering them in their environment. And then you can actually go back with a with a computer and you can analyze and you can kind of find you can find define the edges using the computer across numerous people's responses. So you can see how how that kind of thing works and and that's you know another there are many roles for computers in solving our problems. So um, uh, so yeah. to uh, talking yeah. about yeah. computers yeah. and also because you mentioned complexity is that yeah. one of yeah. the reasons why in the pivot projects you were also interested in using AI systems yes and um, you know AI over the past decade has really grown from 
something rarely used, mm -hmm. uh, except in the university and maybe by national security agencies and things like that, spies, spy agencies, but uh, to something that's used widely and as, as used, being used more and more widely. And there's a certain kind of AI that this group thought would be very useful, and it's basically AI that aids in research. You have this wide world of systems, inter interlocking systems with kind of mysterious connections between them. And, and so we, we used a tool uh, from a company, an Israeli company called Spark Beyond. And they had a bunch of different tools for different purposes, but we used one that was kind of a general purpose research tool that would accelerate research, accelerate discovery, and also did a really good job of finding the kind of the hidden dotted lines between concepts. Or, you know, uh, I guess one of the things, and we see this in, in medicine and pharmacology, is sometimes you've already invented something for use here, and then you can you can actually discover that it could be used somewhere else and, and to, to solve something else. And you can use simulations and modeling to see what else might be solvable with it. So that's the kind of research um, that um, the, the group use, you know, and, and the idea is we need, you know, I guess I guess I would say that my core belief about AI and cognitive computing is that while there are, there are some serious dangers from AI, and some of them we're already seeing, that at its best, by combining machines and humans, by working together, we can accomplish things that neither machines nor humans could do as well on its own. And the, the, the machines can really help us deal with complexity and chaos. And we can use our judgment and creativity and bring that to the table, that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a, I think it's a winning combination. And I, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I wrote a book called Smart Machines in the year 2012. And I wrote it with John Kelly of, of IBM Research. And that really started to explore some of these ideas. But the world of, of AI and cognitive computing has changed very much in the, in the past 10 years. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the approaches used in pivot projects, but could you tell us specifically about uh, the proposals made by you in pivot projects uh, about, uh, I mean, about how to deal with climate change? Would there be something novel there? Yeah, well, I think there are um, the, the, the most interesting one that I think I would mention is that um, one of the one of the founders of Pivot Projects is a guy named Peter Head, mm -hmm. and he is a famous bridge project manager. He he managed huge miles long bridges in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere around the world, mm -hmm. and then he became kind of a city planner, and then he became an environmentalist, and uh, he works with a lot of different organizations, kind of as an advisor. And one of the projects he was involved with was one in uh, at a, a university in Wales called Swansea, mm -hmm. which is on the coast of Wales. And there were some chemists there who were really experimenting with the idea of photovoltaic materials, not panels, not solar panels that we're all very familiar with now, but with coatings, with the idea of coatings. And... Uh, that you could paint the coating on uh, a durable structure, metal, most likely, but perhaps some other durable material, concrete, something like that. And that you could use that in, in place of a solar panel. It would be more durable and less expensive. And so the, the, the way that one of the places they're applying this is they're, they're going to some developing nations specifically India, and the, they have the idea of, of coding uh, the uh, city hall and the, the school or the, you know, institutional structures and turning those buildings into power plants for the community. Now, they're not going to power 
a factory, you know, <coughs> but they could power Wi-Fi, something like that. So you can see how this kind of coding, this radical uh, invention, could have a dramatic effect in, you know, in in India, for instance. You know, there's like 1.3 billion people, and about one billion of them live in villages, right? So you can see that you can see that it could have a profound impact on a society. So I think you know that's one of the one of the things that is just kind of a great idea that you could promulgate. Um, you know, on the on 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 a high level too. You know, Peter, I talked to you about Peter Head and his ideas. He a bunch of people at Pivot Project actually work in, on UN committees, and uh, you know, uh, Peter submitted some of the the documents. The proposals that were considered uh, at the uh, the UN climate conference in Glasgow last year, and and some of these things were ideas developed through pivot projects, and and one was the idea, you know, we've all heard about you know planting trees, how this is, you know, the, one of the answers to climate change, and he basically said, you could plant all the trees you want, but if you don't plant them in the right places, you're not going to maximize your impact, and he said. For instance, if you think about the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is essentially ringed much of it by deserts now. He said, but that was not so uh, 3,000 years ago. The, the Mediterranean was surrounded by woods, by forests. And it was the, the early, it was the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, the Romans, who basically took down the forests to build their ships and to build their cities. And of course their cities burned down over and over again, so they had to rebuild them, you know, that kind of thing. So the, you know, uh, a negative reinforcement happened that has ended in this, this horrible desertification of North Africa, which is extending further and further south. But that, you know, forest in the right place, within the right orientation to to um, mountains and to large bodies of water can flourish and can be can be uh, engines of natural habitat of all kinds and of um, consuming carbon. So there's some experiments going on with this um, along the coast of Brazil, south of Sao Paulo. There's been Overforestation, the, the the deforestation, the 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 um, oh God, I'm trying I'm trying to remember the name of the organization. Oh, Nature Conservancy mm -hmm. is doing some work down there with local governments and and regional governments around that kind of thing, uh, because you know we think of the 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 Amazon and the forests of of Brazil as this magnificent. Uh, resource for the world, but it's it's being, you know, dismantled. So fortunately there are some people who are trying to say, hey, wait a second, let's let's save this or let's regenerate this. So these are those are a couple of the ideas that I think are big ideas that really, you know, I'm not going to claim that pivot projects invented them. It's it's more like you find the an idea and you try to promulgate it, you try to advance it. And uh, and these are things that are that are being done. Mm -hmm. Would you also try to be active politically and suggest policies to try to change how societies are run and perhaps on the individual level to create incentives for people to adopt more environment-friendly behaviors? Well, I think that's something that uh, we have to do. And I, I think I talked a little before about how I believe you have to operate on all these different levels, you know, pan pan global national local you know neighborhood and 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 personal and uh, you know i think there's in the united states right now there's a there's a strong uh movement around electrification of mm -hmm. not just of vehicles but of buildings of heating yeah. of of cooking and uh, you know i think that in some states uh, you know, in some municipalities, these things are catching on. And I think, you know, a lot of places haven't even thought about this. So political, the, the route to awareness is through political activity. And, you know, lobbying, when we think about lobbying of politicians, we think 
it's often a very negative thought because you think of only the most powerful have a voice. Well, you know, we the people have a voice too in democracies. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, electrification is one of those areas where you can ra raise awareness. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm doing that locally. You know, our group, you know, reimagining New Haven in the, in the era of climate change, you know, we're, we're kind of, creating this moment of a it's, it's, it's in a moment of awareness a wake-up call and then feeding a bunch of energy new energy into groups whether they're governmental or nonprofit that already exist to to get people going and moving along and to get support for those ideas and i and you know some of them are are big ideas like electrification and some of them are small ideas like don't have a grass lawn around your house you know things like that mm -hmm. don't don't mow a lawn do you have lawns in portugal uh some people yeah but but it's not very common no thank god in the united states the amount of fossil fuels that are used maintaining lawns and there and there and, and a lawn is basically a natural wasteland because it there's no natural there are no natural services in it the 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 flowers that would grow are cut before they blossom so they can't you know pollinators can't use them you know it's just it's just a it's just a, a horrible system that has become kind of oh this is what people desire this is of course of course you do this well of course now we know we shouldn't do this so you have to change minds around that yeah there's a lot of changing to do i guess <laughs> systemically individually so Absolutely. um so uh, in what ways do you think economic inequality because this is another issue you seem to be worried about connect to climate change yeah well you know i think there are two main angles to this and um it, you know in in developed nations the poor are already most affected by environmental degradation. Mm -hmm. They often live near highways or near railroads or near sewage or near, you know, incinerators or near factories and things like that. And I think as, you know, when you when you think about and often they're kind of clustered down by the rivers because in the United States the rivers have been used by, for industri industrial purposes and for getting rid of waste. Yeah. And then, of course, and of course, the poor people live in the most degraded parts. So, but then, so when you think about climate change, it's all of that plus, plus higher heat. You know, um, when you look ahead towards 2100, uh, the end of this this century, they the the number of days where the heat is expected to be harmful to humans and 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 fatal to numbers of humans triples or quadruples potentially already look in india all those days where it's 130 degrees fahrenheit you know barely you know you're, you're going to have mass death soon because of this so um these are these elements are added to it and i think also you know i mentioned india so we have this band of the equi you know around the equator and the and we have the tropics of cancer capricorn this huge band where the heat is is incredibly high where there's desertification where there's uh drought and uh uh this is going to affect uh food production and it's also going to affect migration, refugees. We're going to have large numbers of climate refugees. And, and right now, ref, economic refugees and, and refugees from war are already causing tremendous social unrest in nations farther north. Yeah. The rise of fascism in the United States and in Europe is directly related to immigration from other from the south and the um so with with climate uh, uh change 
you're going to have mass migration. And it's and, you know, the disruptions that we see today will feel, seem like nothing compared to, to what we'll see then. So we're going to see the misery of the poor compounded and the misery of the poor isn't going to be something that the, these societies can kind of shuffle off to the side, especially in a democracy. You know, this, uh, you know, I think in the United States, there's a, a strong move by white people to try to maintain control and to, to suppress and repress non-white people in order to, in order to, um, to uh, maintain political control and economic control. And I think that's, you know, we're seeing terrible impacts from that, but it's like, it's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the way you're going to solve this problem. So, the, you know, I think these are huge socioeconomic, natural problems all woven up together. And uh, so we need to, we need things like the Pivot Project's approach if we hope to, to deal with them locally mm -hmm. and, and globally. Yeah. So another very big topic we haven't touch, touched on yet is risk. Because, I mean, when it comes to climate change and these more systemic issues we've been talking about, uh, uh, the, uh, these are associated. These are sort of risks people do not intuitively think about or do not consider, particularly in the long term, and when they are they occur on a global scale. So, how do you think we should think about and manage risk in this case? Well, I think um, sea level rise is a good way to think about this because. So in the United States, uh, we have a lot of people who live on the coast and a lot of people who live, um, have housing right on the coast. And a lot of those people are rich. Some are not so rich, you know, but increasingly only rich people can afford it. So we've had a whole system in our nation of where, um, based on the storms of the past, we have a system that supports the rebuilding of housing right where it was. So that's a system that the taxpayer of the United States, they pay to enable rich people to rebuild their houses on the coast. So you can see that that's a system that's unsustainable. And not, 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 I mean, it's unfair, and it's also unsustainable. And, but they're, they're, so we need to have new systems. And, you know, the uh, in a sense, um, you know, the insurance industry should govern this. I mean, if you, if, you, if you basically use the mechanism of insurance, the insurance rates of people on the coast would be so high that they wouldn't be able to rebuild. But in this case, the government has stepped in to subsidize so that people can rebuild. So this is the kind of rethinking and a reevaluation re of risk that we need to do. And, you know, the, the flood maps the, in the United States, the 100-year flood maps, I don't know if you have these in Europe as well, but they said, oh, this is, we're likely, such and such likelihood of, of this kind of flooding within 100 years. Well, those maps are out of date. And, and because of more powerful storms and more hurricanes, uh, for, just as an example, uh, you know, you might have a thousand year storm in a hundred years, <laughs> or you might have five of them, you know? So suddenly all of those risk calculations are thrown open and, and the insurance industry is going to protect itself, right? But, uh, and, and maybe in this case, we should let the insurance company have at it. And, and, and if, if government wasn't making unsustainable things possible, there would be major change. So this is one example where, where a, a, a business and a, and a capitalistic system that sometimes we, we don't like that much because we have to pay high bills. You know, and actually, that's a mechanism that if it's allowed to work, could be, have a very positive effect. Mm -hmm. so. 
Yeah. So that's that's one element of risk. You know, I think others just people don't people don't you know people are not we're not wired to think about the risks of the future. We're wired to think about the threats of the moment. And uh, you know, it, it, ironically, in this case, the the threat of the future, if we if we actually start thinking about and handling the threat of the future, that becomes a threat to the moment. It's an economic threat right now. If, oh, if we suddenly have to invest now, re people recoil against the idea of investing now uh, to to deal with something that they not may not be around to to deal with. You know, they might not experience. So it's there's a weird psychology that's it's quite under well, it's not weird, it's understandable. It's it's a human psychology. Yes, also because perhaps in this particular case the science behind it is very counterintuitive and difficult for people to understand, people who are not specialists, of course, and then you also have people with political agendas pushing for misinformation about yes. climate change. Yes, so. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But even, you know, just, I mean, my, I have a cousin who, I have, my family, one, one end of my family was in Kansas, right in the middle of the United States, which is a farm state. And for many generations, it was, we were farmers. My parent, my father was a farmer, my grandparents were farmers. But I went out there last summer last year, and I saw one of my cousins who used to be a farmer, but now has a manufacturing plant. He manufactures trailer hitches for trucks for hauling, um, you know, boats or, you know, RVs and things like this. And uh, I was talking to him about climate change, and he said, I don't, I don't understand climate change or think about climate change. I just think about weather. Hmm. Well, what is that? That's short term. That's like as if today's weather isn't connected to tomorrow's weather, or the weather here isn't connected to the weather over there. <laughs> so, and and my cousin is a, a very smart, very successful man, much more than I, college educated, you know, uh, and yet that is his view of climate. It doesn't, it doesn't, he doesn't believe in it. So, uh, that's. You know, that's a hard thing to do. How do you change my cousin's mind? And I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe you don't change his mind. Maybe you change his children or his grandchildren's minds. Yeah. Or, or perhaps you have to nudge his behavior in yeah. some way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's yeah. True. So going back to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what do you think should be the lessons drawn from it? I mean, what changes really after the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, of course, we don't know if it ever ends. Of course. Yeah. And, you know, I read an article in the, in the New York Times recently that said maybe we'll, eat, oh, we'll all have COVID four times a year for the rest of our lives. Think about that. So, but I think the... Uh, the lesson from it is we've seen all these different versions of the of the virus and it, it rapidly evolves and you know finds its way finds ways to proliferate and uh, so we're faced with you know so the lesson from that is that we live in this complex world where things are unpredictable you don't just solve a problem and it stays solved, that you have to be kind of nimble, you know, open-minded, uh, ability, you know, that you have to, you have to get soci people within society to, to be more flexible mm -hmm. and to be more open-minded. You can't just be the scientists and the leaders. It has to be the people as well. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the the desire that humans have to bury their heads in the sand, you know, that that is, we've seen how destructive that can be. And, uh, but, you know, I, I think one of the things is, if you look around at the successful people in the world, you know, a lot of successful societies are ones that, where knowledge is respected and where, the ability, I mean, you look at Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley model, 
Well, knowledge and science are respected. Small organizations get together, try to do something fast, experiment fast, try something else. So the Silicon Valley model um, really is a model for, uh, for success and for dealing with this kind of chaos. The, you know, the, in Silicon Valley, they, they celebrate being disruptors as if the status quo is some horrible burden. Uh, and we know that that's not really a, the most healthy viewpoint because, in fact, the world is disrupting itself. And what, what we need Silicon Valley to do is help us re remake ourselves you know, <laughs> rather, than, rather than destroy ourselves. So uh, I think I'd, I'd like to see some, uh, a different kind of point of view from Silicon Valley, not disruptor, but reimaginer, maybe. You know, I think that might be a better word. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that's that kind of uh, idea comes to the fore. Mm -hmm. So one last question about the Pivot project specifically. Uh, how do you look at its future uh, and how, what impact would you like for it to have? Well, I, I, I said before, you know, Pivot Projects is a relatively small group of people, very active in the beginning, lots of ideas spinning off, people kind of going out in their communities with ideas and trying things there. So I think it's, it's actually best as a model, as a way to think about things or as a way to inspire people rather than it's going to have a big impact directly. And one of my goals with my book, The Pivot, is for people, you know, to read it to maybe get inspired to think about, oh, here's something we could do locally, or here's a model of, of working together that we could try. So, you know, my desire, obviously, I, you know, the more books I can sell, I mean, I'm not really, I didn't, I didn't write the book to make money. And I'm, you know, as, as so far, I as an academic publisher, you know, they don't have any, there's no marketing, there's no merchandising there. So, uh, but I hope that it will have impact. And, you know, uh, the, the, the book is the really the, the, the broadest uh, distribution of the ideas from Pivot Projects. And so being on your show is a very powerful thing, a very good thing for Pivot Projects to have. That, that every, you know, you, you want to, as a communicator, you want to reach as many people as you can. But but and you and you do your best to do that. But the other thought I've always had is, you know, if you reach somebody, you and you probably you don't even know who that person is, and that person is somehow inspired or or shaped, their thinking is shaped, and they go on to do something that's very positive. I, that's that's my dream, and I'm sure it happens, but it's unpredictable. And it's unknowable. So I think that's true of Pivot Projects, that, you know, the people who started it, you know, some of them are still involved, and I'm sure it's disappointing to them to see that it's gradually kind of winding down. But, uh, hey, that's just life. It's a life, you know, think about it. We, we've talked offline about some of the deaths of the elders that we've, we've known, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very natural process. Ideas... And, and organizations and groups, they come and they go. And uh, hopefully some of their, I, the best ideas stick and spread. And, you know, we've, we've seen the spread of a virus. It's been very uh, negative. And we see the spread of viruses, you know, some of the things that have spread on, on social media. I have to call them things like viruses, like Trumpism and, and science denial and, and anti-vaccination. Uh, but also, hopefully, good things spread through social media and through these social channels, and like your podcast. I mean, this is this is an example of good ideas spreading. So hopefully, you know, we get the word out. Yeah. Thanks, and thanks for your help. No, thank you so much for being on the show. And let's end on that note. Then let me just mention the book again: "The Pivot: Addressing Global Problems Through Local Action." I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of the interview. And Steve, would you like to tell people about places on the internet where they can find you and your work? Well, um, you know, 
I, I, I think the thing I would point you to, if you're interested in local transformation, is this little initiative we've started in my town, which is called Reimagining New Haven in the Era of Climate Change. And our website really provides a model that others might follow. And it's, uh, it's reimaginingnewhaven.org. So I think that's good. And also I think people, you know, there's the Pivot Projects website, which is pivotprojects.org. You know, there's, 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 there's less activity on it than there was in the past, but there's a lot of ideas and, and things that, that, that people can follow. And also I think there's still, there are still active groups within Pivot Projects. And if somebody wants to go and kind of join in and see what it's all about, uh, you can easily go to the website and kind of raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to learn more. Bring me in. So I, I'd say those are some of the things to do. Okay. So, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate the work you're doing and the other people at Pivot Projects. And I really like the book. So it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Good, good. Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I, I love, you know, I think you ask very good questions. And uh, uh, I'll have a separate conversation with you about the, the name, The Dissenter. I, I, I'm curious about that, and we'll talk about that some other time. Okay. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, and Blanchett Perga, Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimir, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alec, Jonathan Vissel, Jacob Linkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Henry Calenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Nieberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Ugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslin Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dimitri Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, and Max Belby. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafinia, Kian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardis France, Thomas Trumbull, and Nun Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.